Hey, what's good, cannabis investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan, and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from May 27th to June 2nd. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn more, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, and then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. Try to think of these videos as a time capsule. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the U.S. cannabis industry, identify top U.S. MSOs that you keep seeing pop up that you think will be worth more in the future than they are now based on their current market caps and new adult use markets coming online like Ohio, Pennsylvania eventually, and Florida, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. But is there any better news than this? As of Wednesday, May 29th, 97% of the public comments support Schedule 3. We expected a ton of public support. But this is fantastic, right? And so this is the link to the Federal Register. Well, I just wanted to remind anyone commenting, DOJ specifically solicits written comments regarding the economic analysis of the impact of these proposed changes. So the more actual detailed data and examples of states making a shit ton of money and ending prohibition benefiting tons of people in those states, examples of that will help. As DOJ requests that commenters provide detailed descriptions in their comments of any expected economic impacts, especially to small entities. And so just use my videos as a reference. If there's any good resource that you can grab from any past video to put in there, it certainly wouldn't hurt. And so thank you, El Guapotron, for making this simple for everyone. Just a reminder, the deadline to submit your comment is July 22nd. So far, over 8,500 comments already. So you can submit uh, on this page for comments. We've got 51 days left to do so. And then this is actually a suggested wording doc. So this link will be in the description. Uh, submit the comment and it's basically a skeleton you can use. And while this template definitely focuses more on the medicinal aspects of cannabis, I imagine any links to economic wins from ending prohibition in legal states will also go a long way. And so if you haven't left a comment yet, please do. And so this came from a report from Headset as of May 29th highlighting overwhelming support for Schedule 3 on display of public comment period. So we'd love to see the results thus far. You can pause to read if you're interested while just bringing you down to some visuals. Blue comments for, red comments against, uh, certainly overwhelming, and then the image that we saw in the beginning. So links in the comments. Well, we got this surprise one from the Marijuana Herald, and the main reason I'm sharing this is not because the source is unknown, which again leads us to be skeptical, but from my understanding, the Marijuana Herald was correct in calling one of the earlier announcements or dominoes we got this year, and then a few days later, we got that announcement. I believe it was the leak uh, from Associated Press saying that the Biden Amendment was going to start the rescheduling process. But let's see what it says. The Drug Enforcement Administration's proposal to reschedule cannabis is set to be finalized by October, according to an unknown DEA official. So take this with a grain of salt, but the fact that we're hearing this leads us to be optimistic. Now, an official at the DEA tells us that the agency is aiming to complete the review of comments within 60 days at the direction of AG Merrick Garland's office, with a final decision coming soon after. The official says it's possible the review could be completed even quicker, the finalized rule coming by the end of September, but as soon as the end of August. And while it is possible they might move quickly, it's also possible they won't. So plan accordingly for your own situation, but the fact that in an article that was correct from an unknown source earlier this year, a little bit of hopium to get us through this next week. And why should cannabis be descheduled outright? Well, we're going to look at the studies. May 30th study shows cannabis terpenes may relieve chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain. So University of Arizona Health Sciences study published in the Journal of Pain found that cannabis sativa terpenes were as effective as morphine at reducing chronic neuropathic pain and a combination of the two analgesics further enhance pain relief without negative side effects. Details here if you wanted to pause to read. As always, the links will be in the comments. But straight from the source, the Journal of Pain, this this study came out originally May 2nd, 2024, and so, hey, the more we study terpenes and compounds in cannabis, the more we find out it's a miracle medicine. And to read it and weep, together these studies identify cannabis terpenes as potential therapeutics for chronic neuropathic pain and identify a receptor mechanism for this activity. And so, certainly a reason for the pain medication industry not to want this plant to be legal. And later in this video, we're going to find out a new development from Cureleaf that could possibly be a game changer uh, as well. And so with that from PubMed.com, as of May 3rd, cannabis use may be associated with reduced prevalence of prostate cancer. Some interesting findings here. And so I invite you to pause to read, but get this. Um, in the multivariable analysis, former cannabis use was associated with lower prostate cancer compared to never using the plant at all. That's fascinating. Current use was also suggestive with reduced prevalence, but was not statistically significant, possibly due to the lower sample size of current users versus past users that aren't currently. So anyways, our findings from a large national survey provide additional data to link cannabis use with lower prostate cancer prevalence. 
I'm gonna keep smoking my weed. Oh, we got this one from Springer Link. Uh, medical cannabis use in Australia seven years after legalization from May 28th, so very fresh. Findings from an online cannabis as medicine survey. So I invite you to pause to read the background and methods while well, going straight to the results and conclusions. From harm reduction perspective, there is much to recommend prescribed medical cannabis. It has fewer side effects than illicit. It's used more safely, oral or vaporized versus smoking, gives consumers greater certainty regarding the composition and quality of their medicine, and does not risk exposure to the criminal justice system because this plant was a medicine all along, and it should have always been used that way. Of concern, however, though, because these losers certainly just cannot give people the benefit of the doubt when they share their personal experience and things work for them, is the apparent willingness of prescribers to prescribe for indications for which there is limited evidence of efficacy, such as mental health and sleep conditions. Well, let me tell you, cannabis for mental health or sleep conditions will go a much further way than alcohol or pills. It's just a fact, and I will die on that hill. It is what it is. Well, from High Times, Jelly Roll says cannabis has kept me sober. The country star opened up about how pot has kept him off of hard drugs like opioids and Xanax because study after study debunks the propagandists that cannabis is an exit drug from harder drugs and not, in fact, the gateway drug that alcohol typically is. And so I'm not going to get too much into this, but highlighting someone who has gotten off hard drugs with cannabis shuts the prohibitionists right up. And so with that, some updates out of Florida, though, this was really a big one. Um, but the main thing we like to see is that famed pot daddy, John Morgan, who I believe is the owner, president or part owner of Morgan & Morgan. And so if you watch certain podcasts from, say, current relevant comedians, you will see Morgan & Morgan a ton. And it seems like they are a law firm that sort of gets it and are backing the right issues as famed pot daddy John Morgan becomes the face of Florida. Now, there's a video. I'm not going to play it, but just wanted to highlight that Morgan, whose efforts helped legalize medical cannabis through a different constitutional amendment in 2016, will be the new face of Yes on 3. Three radio ads were debuted Wednesday with Morgan's voice urging voters to show up at the polls to finish what he started. He clarified he's not bankrolling the campaign, though, this time around. Do I use cannabis? Hell yes. When do I use cannabis? Every fucking day, Morgan said. And this is the kind of person we want fighting for common sense. During a 35-minute free willing press conference in his Orlando office. They don't call me pot daddy for nothing. So not only do we have a, a lawyer with balls, but we have a functional stoner as well on our side. And so very, uh, very hopeful that this will go in the right direction. Let me know if you have any comments or what you think about this. But going forward, as Florida does seem to get more and more interesting and we find new and more developments every single week, thank you, Dank Informer, for connecting some certain dots for us. And again, this is speculation, but we know that there's the legal adult use cannabis industry that provides the cannabis plant which has Delta-8 THC and CBD. And then we also know there's the loophole in the farm bill, which allows the hemp industry to um, extract Delta-9 fake synthetic THC from the hemp plant and sell that legally through gas stations. And apparently that has been the case going on in the US. And, and hey, maybe the joke's on us for taking so long to catch on or not investing in the hemp industry versus the legal adult use industry that's actually providing Delta-8 THC, which is the real plant, and changing the status quo for the better. So I don't feel bad at all, but I just see this as another example of government cheese from however many years back when how can the government make cannabis actually legal but not give people the real plant that's going to help them and provide a safe and non-addictive medicinal alternative? It's such horseshit. And Given the fact that there's so much we don't know behind the scenes, who incentivized this loophole? Who funded Mitch to actually let it go through? And Mitch must just be rolling it. And the fact that they're this cocky, how's this legal? In 2018, Uncle Sam passed the farm bill and bam, Delta struts onto the scene, legal as a Netflix subscription. It's just like finding a loophole in the matrix. So while the real Delta 8 THC that comes from the cannabis plant might still be playing hide and seek with the law, the fake synthetic Delta 9 government weed is out there living its best life. And so, hey, take from that what you will. Again, I've never tried this synthetic crap. Let me know in the comments if it's as bad as I think it is. And maybe it's not that bad. I don't know. But given how much of a role distribution would have in these fake products getting around the country, seems like these loose regulations have always been by design. It's just so annoying that it takes us so long to freaking catch on. And so just to give you a visual example of what the legal adult use industry has to put up with while operating with both hands tied behind their backs, while any producer in the hemp industry can laugh their way to the bank, exploiting this loophole from the farm bill put in place by Mitch McConnell, you know who, incentivized by who knows. And ultimately, this is from Whitney Economics in their 2023 report, highlighting the size of this market already in 2022. And this is before we're seeing the big push of THCA flower this last six to 12 months when there's rumors that there would be an amendment that might close the farm bill loophole. And so again, take these numbers with a grain of salt, but the low estimates for 2022 market size of hemp derived, hemp -derived cannabinoids was 21.3 billion. The medium estimate was 28.4 billion and the high end estimate was 35.8 billion. And this is 2022. So fuck, imagine the potential for the adult use companies once this loophole closes and once we get either into Schedule 3 or 
already scheduled where it should have been all along. But get this, on top of all this mess that, you know, we're kind of connecting more dots on, Anthony Varel exposes uh, how certain politicians seem to be shills for this industry, much like Mitch McConnell, as DeSantis is moving forward toward vetoing bill that would regulate sale of these synthetic fake Delta 9 THC cannabis products in Florida. So according to those familiar with his thinking, DeSantis is counting on the hemp industry to finance the campaign against Amendment 3, which would legalize cannabis for adult use. So you cannot make this shit up. And DeSantis is the new McConnell, effectively. And so take from that what you will. It's it's fucking mind-boggling. It's frustrating. Um, and you just realize how deep things really end up going. Um, but yeah, it seems like DeSantis wants to keep illegal uh, government gas station weed uh, live and well in Florida and wants to uh, at least make things interesting and muddy the waters for the uh, legal operators in the state. So more here if you wanted to pause to read from CBS. As always, the links will be in the comments. But on to some good news from MSOs and more more findings, uh, as this is the study I referenced earlier, Cureleaf International and New York State Cannabis Regulation Update. Not necessarily a study, but some recent findings from Cureleaf and Dr. Mikhail Sodergren. Perhaps a couple of examples of that. Um, one, of, one of which is, you know, just, just how we focus on developing, developing products in Europe. Uh, and so our biggest, our biggest group of patients here in Europe are, uh, in fact, globally, are chronic pain patients in the medical okay. space, yep. about 50 percent. And so we looked at this and we thought, how do we how do we develop the best medicine for those patients? Uh, and at the moment, what, mo what most companies are doing is they're extracting cannabis oils from various different cultivars and strains and essentially just trying what works best. And that's not really how you should approach this. And so what we've done is over the last four or five years, if not more, we've gone back to basics and we've gone into the lab. We've tested individual cannabinoids looked at individual cannabinoids in combination with others. We published widely on this, looked at terpenes and you know, all the constituents, individual constituents of the plant. And we've seen um, you know, recently that in a, in, a, in a neuropathic pain model in a Petri dish, so in vitro, we have come up with a combination of cannabinoids and terpenes, which essentially obliterates a pain signal. Wow. Um, and yeah. so that, that, that is in very stark contrast to just extracting um, a, a, a tincture, say, from the plant. And this is something that we're, we're just filing IP on this week or next, and that we're gonna have commercialized for UK patients in June. Right? Fascinating. And so keep in mind, this is still in a Petri dish, but at the same time, it highlights that over time, what's going to be the biggest indicator of cannabis becoming normalized? The fact that the medicine works better than the alternatives. I think that's ultimately going to speak for itself in time. So fascinating. I invite you to grab the link in the comments to read more, but that is a huge discovery and that's really going to disrupt the... Uh, pharmaceutical industry while well, Cureleaf International partners with UK Task Force to lead cannabis research revolution. And so more here if you wanted to pause to read, but seems like the UK is opening up their cannabis research and we know who basically has first dibs in that market there, Cureleaf. And so from Pablo Zwanek, vape. Congrats, Boris Jordan. In this report, we looked at the key trends in vape and vape hardware suppliers, AIOs, fruity flavors, larger formats, and new closed loop systems. Uh, are all underpinning growth. And so this report from Pablo, Vaping and Hardware Suppliers, if you're interested on it, 27 pages. Um, but ultimately, this comes off of a tweet from Boris. Uh, this comes from May 29th, saying approximately 90% of growth in the vape category is driven by convenient all-in-one products with unique flavors and formats leading the way. Select is an important brand in our global portfolio, and our new fruit stick expands our reach to a broader group of adult consumers. And so uh, interesting findings there, uh, and that report is available from Pablo if you are interested. Well, truly announces litigation settlement and acquisition of Ohio assets just in time for uh, adult use to flip in June. And so truly adds two medical dispensaries in Beaver Creek and Columbus to their Ohio footprint. And so love to see them uh, coming to a resolution for this litigation. In accordance with the settlement, truly will acquire Harvest of Ohio, which will hold licenses for medical cannabis dispensaries in Columbus and Beaver Creek. The Harvest of Ohio medical dispensary in Athens will be transferred to Arian Kirkpatrick and will be rebranded under the name Mavuno. Separately, Kirkpatrick will divest ownership of Harvest Grows LLC and Harvest Processing LLC, which operate a production facility in Ironton to unrelated third parties. Truly will enter into service agreements to provide operational support to the Ironton production facility and these third parties, and Truly will pay any material amount to Kirkpatrick. Other terms of the resolution remain confidential. And so Kim is obviously happy, and that gives uh, them more exposure in Ohio, which should turn on fairly soon as WFMJ.com uh, highlights Rec Cannabis set for June launch. Now, I don't believe we have an official day yet, though the applications are able to begin being submitted on June 7th, I believe. 
And so uh, it's just a video, which I'm not going to play. But main thing to highlight is that Ohio is going adult use in June, baby, and we're all very excited for it. Well, uh, from Pablo again, Ohio, more on that topic. 12 MSOs have ops there, and more may enter via M&A. A 4X ramp is possible, giving neighboring states, example, Michigan, Ohio's underdeveloped med market, and a good number of stores by end of year one. Great economics too. And keep in mind, the idea being that everyone selling medical first in Ohio gets first dibs at selling rec too. And so from Pablo, this report on Ohio, 28 pages, EBITDA torque by MSO. If you're interested in going through it, these links will all be in the comments. While Air partners with iconic Kowloon restaurant to launch limited edition Livia Kowloon Mai Tai THC infused seltzer. And so which markets are they launching this? Um, Boston's area landmark restaurant. So it seems like this will just be in Massachusetts to start. Beverages will be available at air dispensaries across greater Boston, as well as retail partners across the state beginning today. So good to see them trying to perfect their beverage game before the adult use industry finally gets their time to shine with beverages. And with that from MD Stock Trader, another big uh, merger this week. Uh, not many people are talking about this major story. And I'll admit, until he pointed all of these details out, I didn't think much of it. Um, but this is the essential essential highlight and press release consortium and Riv Capital announced business combination. So I invite you to pause to read the details here. Otherwise, you can grab the link to go through it if you're interested. But to summarize, one, Riv Capital is funded by Scott's miracle Grow a big multinational American company, and they're becoming a major holder of Consortium, almost 49% of the combined company. But keep in mind, Consortium is technically still right now a Schedule 1. So what is Scott's Miracle Grow preparing for post-Schedule 3? Um, two, Consortium's market cap is less than $50 million, and this erases $175 million of debt, and shareholders still get 51% of the combined company. The biggest concern as a Consortium shareholder was the horrible balance sheet. While this is significant dilution, the company moves to a $5 million net debt and has deep pocket sugar daddy in Scott's miracle Grow. See OGI price action after uh, British American tobacco investment. And four, I believe this is just the start of M&A in the cannabis industry that will accelerate as we see the Schedule 3 milestone achieved. I'd love to believe this to be true too. Let me know what you think. But looking at the details, it does seem like there's more going on here and Scott's miracle Grow is preparing for the future, right? As the transaction has the support of Scott's miracle Grow, transactions are being discussed as we speak. This DA comment period is also a time for M&A. Glasshouse Management said yesterday that big alcohol and tobacco are doing their due diligence. So who's next for a big merger or acquisition, similar to what we saw in Canada in 2018 with Constellation Brands injecting $4 billion into Canopy? The hopes is that a US MSO is not going to piss that money away uh, quite as loosely as Canopy did. And so uh, just to highlight as well down here, more information uh, for anyone that's interested in going through it, key transaction highlights. Uh, as always, links in the comments. But with that, from Todd Harrison, what are we looking at here? ATB on U.S. cannabis. The rescheduling rulemaking process is ongoing, but MSOS valuations appear to not be pricing in any reasonable probability of rescheduling happen, which is wild. It does not concern me at all that retail is just selling. I think the market is being purposely held down because they can be because we're on the over-the-counter markets. Call me crazy. Call me a conspiracy theorist. I don't give a shit. But I do believe that once things play out over time, the price will certainly increase dramatically because none of this is priced in, including Florida, including Ohio, including a lot of the other factors too, uh, removal of 280, right? So take from that what you will. I invite you to pause to read the rest, but just wanted to share my take on what that means. Well, well, this is another one from ATB, which makes me a little more skeptical of the last one that we saw, mainly just because their projections based on what we can see price increase wise once 280 is removed are pretty sad and low. I think these could be much higher. Now, again, I'm someone with bags that obviously wants them to be much higher. I could be wrong, but this is rescheduling alone, not new markets coming on or any other developments, big M&A that we might get. So again, take these all with a grain of salt, not advice, plan accordingly for your own situation, but uh, just more and more information that you can take in to try and paint a picture uh, for yourself to make your own investment decisions. Well, a technical one from Greenwave Advisors will do my best to decipher this one for you. The following illustrates the severity of 280E in relation to pre-tax income loss. Note that under normal circumstances for any other industry that is not discriminated against in the U.S., like the cannabis industry, net operating losses can be used to offset future taxable income not allowed while cannabis remains Schedule 1, right? And so apparently GTI is the outlier among its peers in this. Now, in comparison to cash flow from operations, the optics may suggest that the majority of the Tier 1 CFO exceeds pre-tax income. However, Green Thumb is again the outlier because it has made all tax payments on a timely basis, regardless of their views on the tax rate, right? Others have held back. So it seems like Green Thumb, obviously best positioned in a lot of ways, being the best financially healthy. But it's it's good to think of this big picture wise, because again, once we're post schedule three, 280 is gone. A few years down the line, post M&As, new markets coming online. 
this picture is going to be fascinating in five years. And it's not just going to be green thumb, but here are the visuals that they wanted to provide with this. Well, if I happen to miss anything worth noting, please comment as it'll help me and other investors, I'm sure, get a little smarter and understand this technical financial jargon a little bit more. Well, Axios Nashville highlights May 30th. Most Tennessee voters support legal cannabis, according to a poll. Seems to be the natural progression once you legalize for medical, you realize, oh, it's good for people to have the safer non-addictive medicinal alternative. And why it matters, the finding, which was included in last week's Vanderbilt poll, is emblematic of a broader cultural shift as other states have embraced legalization, and clearly it works, and the Biden amendment moves to ease federal restrictions. And so that's 60% of Tennessee voters uh, were favored or favored it. And then just to highlight, the poll was conducted April 26th to May 9th, included 1,003 voters uh, with a small margin of error. And with that, from New York, Thank you, Cy Scott, out of Headset for sharing this. With New York continuing to issue cannabis retail licenses at a rapid pace because they're playing catch-up after three years of fucking the dog, there is still a long way to go with per capita comps coming in at 6.8 retailers per million residents. So pretty pathetic, considering if we look at just these states, you think Michigan, California, Florida, and New York. Just the reputation over time, New York, the Big Apple. <laughs> How could the Big Apple fuck up a business opportunity so big, right? They're trying to... Uh, trying to fix the problems that they created themselves, but likely not going to do that until they, you know, fire everybody and put in some new competent people. But hey, good to see Michigan just crushing it per capita. Well, Baltimore police probe string of cannabis store burglaries in Federal Hill. Just got to share this because you can thank Schmuck Schumer. There's no one else to thank but Schmuck for this. As SAFE has had the votes to pass for years now, and he's the only one making this industry more and more dangerous for everyone involved. Let alone be able to open a bank account like anyone else in any other industry in the US. It's unbelievable, but this is the work of schmuck. You can't put the blame on anyone else. Ultimately too, this is the work of schmuck because cannabis has been legal in Maryland for medical for a long time. It was recently legalized and launched for adult use in July of 2023. So you can't even say, oh, this is all caused by legalizing adult use. It's not because that happened in July of 2023. A big portion of it is the fact that these legal industries operating in Maryland cannot put their cash in banks, hence incentivizing criminals to rob them. All thanks and brought to you by schmuck fucking Schumer, one of the most despicable humans alive, almost like Harry J. Anslinger. Well, this is the only article I will share from the shitty government mouthpiece clickbait publication, mainly because it does highlight the blatant discrimination in the title, as medical cannabis is the leading cause of rejected gun permits or discrimination in Hawaii. New report from AG's office shows, and obviously this is unconstitutional, should not be allowed. Seems state legal cannabis use was the leading cause of gun permits being denied, 40.7%, with mental health issues responsible for about a quarter of rejections and domestic health disqualifying about 7%. What about alcoholics or people with alcohol problems? That should likely be a factor if you're going to deny people for using a plant that should have never been put in the Schedule 1 in the first place. Sadly, this wouldn't be deemed unconstitutional because of the bullshit Schedule 1 classification. Thankfully, it's going to be changed, but it's still insane that we know it's built on lies and a farce, yet it's that that still allows the U.S. government to discriminate against people for using a legal medicine in their state, right? This needs to be done away with decades ago. Fortunately, we're close, ladies and gentlemen. While the last few stories from Dennis Rudev invest in the future of humanity, invest in the future of cannabis, this seems to be a medicinal cannabis promo video from LK Green Capital, highlighting a lot of what I've highlighted in past videos with many, many studies uh, aiming towards the potential of the medical benefits of cannabis. So we'll just play this. Legal cannabis has emerged as a promising treatment for various medical conditions. No shit. Research indicates that cannabinoids, the active compounds in cannabis, can help manage chronic pain by interacting with the body's endocannabinoid system. Everyone you see today, I recommend asking them, hey, do you know that you have an endocannabinoid system in your body? And see what they say. I imagine the majority will say they have no clue. This system plays a crucial role in regulating pain, mood, and appetite. Research indicates that cannabinoids, the active compounds in cannabis, can help manage chronic pain by interacting with the body's endocannabinoid system. This system plays a crucial role in regulating pain, mood, and appetite. Cannabis has also shown potential in reducing inflammation, which can benefit patients with conditions like arthritis and multiple sclerosis. Additionally, some studies suggest that cannabis can alleviate symptoms of anxiety and depression by influencing neurotransmitter activity in the brain. Research indicates that cannabinoids can modulate the immune system, potentially reducing chronic inflammation. Furthermore, cannabis has been found to help manage neuropathic pain, a common symptom in neurological disorders. What Additionally, some studies suggest that cannabis can alleviate symptoms of anxiety and depression by influencing neurotransmitter activity in the brain. While the medical community continues to explore these benefits, many patients have already reported significant improvements in their quality of life. 
While the medical community continues to explore these benefits, many patients have already reported significant improvements in their quality of life. However, it's essential to consult with a healthcare professional before considering cannabis as a treatment. I just think it's wise to differentiate between the medical industry and the pill-pushing pharmaceutical industry because one is certainly more of a medicine than some sort of a Band-Aid. While from the Green Room uh, Compassionate Cannabis Clinic, they feature Don Murphy, and I just wanted to share this because uh, any bit of Don I enjoy watching. And so this seems to be him talking about what's happening with the feds and the benefits of medical cannabis with a doctor, uh, Barry Gordon, and Ruta Junairi. So I've not watched this, but figured I would add it. Link will be in the comments if you want to hear what Don has to say, uh, speaking with the doctor and obviously doing the educating that... We've been trying, pushing hard for for a very long time. Well, for a global trip to end this off, talking drugs, Poland is having a medical cannabis revolution. So we'd love to see this as more and more states. And hey, seems like Poland was able to go medical, haven't tried for adult use yet, but their medical industry is thriving. So that's certainly a great precedent for Europe. Now, more here if you wanted to pause to read, but mainly just going to bring you down to this visual, highlighting that the number of fulfilled prescriptions for medical cannabis source... Uh, Facti Canopne 2024, but look at the jump from 2021, 33,000, 2022, 108,000, 2023, 276,000. Love to see that in Poland, uh, especially the fact that people are getting a safer non-addictive medicinal alternative. Well, quantity of medical cannabis distributed via pharmacies. Wow, seems like they're catching up to Germany almost for a, a country with much smaller population. We'd love to see that. So more here if you wanted to pause to read or grab the full link in the comments. While Nepal apparently to legalize cannabis cultivation for medicinal purposes. And while we've heard about Nepal doing this in the past, apparently they will legalize it announced on Tuesday while presenting budget estimates for the 2024 to 2035 fiscal year. And so the arrangements will be made for commercial cultivation and consumption while unveiling the budget for the fiscal year of next year. When might it go into effect, though? I was reading through this. Nepal is a signatory on the 1961 Bullshit Narcotics Act, which classifies it as a hard drug, though. Um, the finance minister projected an economic growth of 6% for the upcoming fiscal year and said the government will keep inflation rate within the limit of 5.5%. So I just don't know when this would go into effect, but it seems like this year if they're allocating it into their budget. And so... Yeah, if you know any more, let me know in the comments, but good on Nepal for coming around and getting that going. While well, will Slovenia be the next European country to legalize cannabis outright? That would be awesome. Um, a June 9th national vote in Slovenia will give citizens the chance to approve referendums on medical cannabis as well as personal cultivation and possession. So maybe cannabis or adult use light, similar to Germany. However, even if approved, it's still possible that the government coalition will not adopt them. And so uh, it's very early in the process in Slovenia, but it seems like they are taking a page out of Germany's book. So... Uh, we'll find out more on that June 9th, and I will update y'all, but more here if you wanted to pause to read. Well, last one, before we sign off, a huge milestone is Japan moves ahead with cannabis reform. And while it'd be great if it was full-out reform, it is still just more for CBD, but apparently a bill has been launched with a comment period, um, as the preliminary proposal suggests that Japan is seeking to forgo the complex and lengthy novel foods process for CBD products and could become the first country to approve CBD in food. So that's very interesting. I know that CBD does very well in skincare products, and I know that's probably booming in Japan and Korea right now. Opinions are now being solicited on five topics, including law enforcement, THC analysis methods, the development of related laws and regulations, and first and second class cultivation license review. So it seems like more could be coming, although we're still a long way out from THC being legal in Japan. But that would give me a reason to certainly want to go back. But that is it for today's episode, folks. So I want to thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos. And I will catch you next week for this week in cannabis news. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.